experienced an unspeakable tragic event yesterday. And then we have over 60 students that are uh, a couple hours away from our campus today on a youth retreat. Would you just join me in praying for both of these situations? Uh, Father, uh, these are our neighbors. They matter to us. I know they matter to you. Um, the kind of trauma and grief they're going through right now is, is beyond anyone's capacity to manage alone. Would you remind them they're not alone? Would you press in all around them today, comfort their hearts, strengthen them, um, help them see what could be if they put their faith in you today. And then for our students, uh, they're gathering for their last uh, meeting this morning before they return. Would you speak powerfully into their lives? Uh, of course, we want them to have a good time, but we want something to be spoken to them that, that causes the trajectory of their life to be something that would not only honor you, but bring fulfillment to them. We ask that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Um, I'm told that 47% of uh, people experience anxiety regularly. It's growing among adults, adolescents, and children. We have all kinds of phobias and fears in nearly half of those who acknowledge anxiety say that it actually impairs their ability to live life the way they hoped that they could. Technology and our standard of living is certainly helping, but it has not eliminated. And the medical and the psychological community do all that they can to help people navigate these things. Anxiety can occur at any age, and it does. And for people of faith, we often wonder that if, our, if we are anxious, does that mean that our faith is weak or maybe not even real? This is what we start wrestling with. We feel as though maybe when we are afraid, it's some kind of disobedience. So we can worry about what we don't have, and we can worry about what we might lose. 63% of the people in our nation live paycheck to paycheck, which means that their resources can last for one to two weeks. By the way, that's true of half of all people who make six-figure income. Why is this important? In Jesus' day, 55%, according to historians who've kind of gauged what the standard of living was uh, back in the ancient world, 55% of the people that Jesus was speaking to had enough resources for today. That's it. And an additional 25% didn't even have enough resources for that day. And Jesus talks to them about why they might be anxious, because they have a lot to fear. The truth is their country was occupied by a foreign military power. Their resources were very limited. Their health could be easily interrupted. And they had genuine losses that they regularly suffered. So what does Jesus have to say to them? What does Jesus have to say with people who have that much reason to be afraid? Does he tell his listeners that if they live a good life, they will have a good life? Does he teach them some tricks to avoid the bad things from happening to them? And the answer is no. Trying to avoid problems does not make us less afraid. Trying to avoid problems does not make us less afraid. We have to stop defining faith in ways that it looks like we're avoiding life. This is how Jesus speaks about this topic. So having more does not seem to relieve anxiety. We have more than they did. We are just as anxious or even more anxious. Having more seems to give us more to worry about. And uh, some of us prefer not to use the term anxiety. We're uncomfortable with that term. We don't like how it makes us uh, look. And so we'll use the word stress. 
So let's just check. How many here have had a reason to be stressed a little bit in the last week? <laughs> yes. So stress is actually a reaction to an external force. So if you're walking down the, the street and a, a dog comes out of the neighbor's house and, and rushes towards you and it looks like it might do you harm, you're going to experience stress. Okay. Anxiety is when you start worrying about walking down the street again. Even when the issue is resolved, we still find ourselves being anxious over it. Here's what I want you to think about this morning. Worry reveals what we love. Worry reveals what we love. This is how Jesus started his conversation in his Sermon on the Mount. And uh, he's talking to his disciples and an increasingly gathering crowd. And he says this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Worry reveals what we love. Uh, our granddaughter picked up a phrase recently, and, and uh, someone would ask her something, and she would say, I don't care about that. <laughs> and so we're, we were trying to figure out, where did she learn that phrase? And so the way you figure it out is you start listening to what other people in her life are saying. And you will not believe where she learned that phrase. She learned it from Pop Pop. <laughs> it turns out, I don't care about that. <laughs> uh, the truth is, is that when we do care about something and we value something and we treasure something or someone, that's the source of, or can be a source of anxiety in our lives. You love your friends, so what happens? You're afraid you might lose them or afraid you might never make them. We love our spouse, so we're, we worry something will happen to them. Or we worry they will do something that will break the relationship with us. We love our home, so we worry someone might break in or in some way we could lose it. We, we love money, so we worry we will not have enough to make us feel secure. See, our anxiety actually reveals what we love. But what we love is not always obvious. Sometimes there are things under the things. So we can love our kids, right? We want them to do well. We also want them to behave in a way that shows other people that we are good parents. <laughs> because when they do really unwise things, we, we are afraid how we might be perceived. We can love our home but we can also use it as a means by which we establish our status in life. If I live in this kind of home, in this kind of neighborhood. Question, if you love God, do you worry about him? It's a good question. And what I will tell you is, if you see God as a means by which you use to get all the other stuff you want, you're going to worry a lot more. If you see God as the most generous and loving being in all the universe, you're going to worry less. Uh, if we love honor, then we're going to engage in attention-seeking behavior and we're going to be uh, fairly ambitious in life. If we love money, we're going to err on the side of greed. If we love pleasure, we're going to uh, pursue a lot of things that are just self-indulgence. If we, if we love treasure in our lives, see, what's the word? It's treasure. Jesus says there are two kinds of treasure. There's treasure that's temporary. It can wear out or it can be stolen. And then there's treasure that's eternal. And because of the temporary nature of the things that we treasure, we worry. Um, it's really enjoyable to watch two young people fall in love and, and start a life together. 
but at some point one of them is going to lose the other. They're going to stand by an open grave and say their finals goodbyes. And when you know that, you start worrying. Does Jesus have anything to say to us? He does. Let, let's continue on. Our goals can actually become our gods. Our goals can actually become our gods. This is what he says beginning in verse 22. The eye is the lamp of your body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body would be full of light. If your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Our, our heart is drawn to the things we value. They become our treasures. So our goals can actually become more than just goals. They can become gods to us. He talks about, we talked about two kinds of treasure. Jesus talks about two kinds of eyes. There's healthy eyes and there's unhealthy eyes. What do we use our eyes to do? Well, obvious to see, but not just see what's in front of us, but to see where we would like to go. We aim at things. It's a big deal. And if we aim at unhealthy things, then our life becomes very dark. And if we aim at healthy things, our, light can be, our life can be filled with light. Unworthy things bring darkness into us. So the question is, where are you aiming? Another question, what do you refuse to look at? What are you afraid to look at? Now, Bob Dylan actually didn't invent the lyric, you've got to serve somebody. Jesus said it first. And our money and our possessions can serve us or we can serve them. And what I can tell you is when money serves us, we can do some very generous and noble things with it. But when we serve money, we become less generous, we become more proud, and we become less tolerant. When you just look out over our culture, what are you seeing? This is how the Apostle Paul wrote about it to a young minister in the faith. He says in 1 Timothy 6, 17, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant because if you have a lot of money, the temptation is to be arrogant. Not a lot of people talk about this. But so, for example, right, if you go to a doctor who specializes in cardiology, you don't assume that that's the guy to go to if if the transmission goes out on your car, right? Likewise, if I'm having trouble with my heart, I don't go to the auto mechanic. And the auto mechanic doesn't assume he can fix my heart, and the cardiologist can't assume, doesn't assume he can fix my car, but it's amazing how often once we make a lot of money, we assume we can fix anything. It's a great temptation. So tell those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good and to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. When we trust in our resources and we compare ourselves with others, we're just going to be more anxious. Next point, Jesus kind of raises on this topic because God doesn't just create basic things. He creates beautiful things. God's not a minimalist. He says in Matthew 6, 25, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. By the way, they don't just stand there with their mouth open, waiting for food to come in. Birds spend a lot of time. By the way, they eat a lot, too. 
the, the bird that eats the least amount actually eats 17% of his body weight every day. If you're a hummingbird, 100% of your body weight every day. That's way more than you eat. Look at the birds of the year. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't store away in barns, yet your father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, and yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. How many have discovered that is true? Each day has enough trouble, right? Yeah. There's many anxieties. So there's two kinds of treasures and two kinds of eyes, but there's many kinds of anxieties. We can worry about life. Like, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? And, and what Jesus says is, you have to think about how your heavenly father uses the word more. And it's not just more stuff, but it's more value. And he says, you are more valuable than anything else. That's how, that's how Jesus wants us to see it. God doesn't just create basic things. He creates beautiful things. God's not just concerned about our spiritual life. He's all con also concerned about our physical needs. Our culture tells us we just need more stuff, and somehow that will increase our value. But a lot of us have already figured out that doesn't work as well as we hoped. Your Father knows what you need. And Jesus reminds us how valuable we are to God. He tells us to remember two things, basically. One is, remember your value to God, and second, remember that you are not God. You're not God. And that's a good thing. Trying to be God is the oldest and most common temptation known to human beings. We see it first with Adam and Eve. If you eat this fruit, you will be like God. What makes God God? Well, a lot of things, but there's, there's some attributes that uh, those who make a study of theology sort out pretty quickly in their lives. And the first is, is that God knows everything. We do not. Well, let's just check. How many are willing to acknowledge this morning you do not know everything? There's still something out there you haven't quite sorted out. Yeah. We worry about what we do not know, and we try to guess what is uncertain. And when somebody asks a question, sometimes we just make stuff up. Why do we do that? Because we don't want to look like we don't know something. Why is it so hard to say these words? I don't know. Or these words, I don't care about that. <laughs> Question, do you really believe you would worry less if you knew more? If you actually knew more, you'd worry a lot more. God has all power, we do not. He can do anything. Nothing is impossible to him. We have limited strength. We have limited authority. Sometimes I can't even get my dog to do what I want. We assume we'd have less anxiety if we had more power, but more power comes with more re responsibility. And I can make the argument, we're already anxious enough with the authority we have. How are we supposed to deal with this? Another thing, God can be everywhere. Don't know how he pulls that off. I've told God I don't have to be omnipresent. That's everywhere. Just dual present would be really helpful. Two places at one time, but we can't. We try. In fact, some of you, your body is here right now, but you are not here. I do not know where you are. Some of you are in Florida. Some of you are getting the meal ready. You're thinking about all the stuff you have to do. 
Some of you are replaying in your head a thing that didn't go the way you wanted, and now you're trying to sort out a way to fix it. Anytime I talk in a room like this, the amount of time travel going on in here is terrifying. <laughs> we, we don't need a machine. It's just how it is. Our mind wanders. What happens when, that, when we do that is we spread ourselves really thin, and it's very hard to be in the place we're in. The secret to less anxiety is not being in more control and not knowing more and, and, and not trying to be in more places than we already are. The secret to managing our anxiety is to remember that God is with you and God knows what you need and God has all power and God is with you wherever you are. Maybe rather than trying to get more knowledge and more power and to be more places, maybe better goals are to draw closer to God and to fully receive his grace and to, and, and to desire to reflect his heart. See things as gifts to share. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come up. We want certainty, I get it. And we assume that we would enjoy life more if we knew the outcome, okay? Um, I do not know the outcome of the Bills game today. Truth be told, I have a little anxiety <laughs> about that. But it won't keep me from enjoying the game. When you read a book, you don't know how it will end, but you enjoy reading it. But all of a sudden, when it comes to the rest of our life, we have to know everything before we can enjoy anything. It's simply not true. Anxiety robs us of the joy that God intends for us. Faith is not a way for you to control your life. Faith is a way to actually live your life, to enjoy it. We don't have to fuse ourselves with the feelings that we have that makes us anxious. Feelings are real, but they're not always right. And we can take a step back as hard as that sounds. How do you do that? The psalmist David would say it this way at one point. He would say, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. He did not say, if I am afraid. He assumed there's going to be things in life that are way beyond our capacity, and they're going to cause us some anxiety. But he had a strategy for when it happened. This is how Paul would write to the Philippian church. This is the key. Don't worry about anything. That's not just a command. It's an invitation. You could better say it like this. You don't have to worry about anything. How? Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. And then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. That's it. I don't know stuff, but I'm still experiencing peace. I don't have enough authority and power in this situation, but I can still experience peace. I can't be there or they can't be here but I can still experience peace and his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Invite God to be God in your situation and remind yourself that you are not. And it's amazing how that peace will displace our anxiety. So would you bow your heads this morning? And I would like you to just think for a half a second, what are the things that are driving some anxiety in you today? What is it that robs you of sleep, keeps you from enjoying a good thing that's happening right now? What is it that, that just wears you out? And I want you to, to call that to your mind. It might be a person, it might be a situation, it might be something at work, it could be something at home, it could be relational, whatever it is. Call it out right now in your mind. And I want you to do something. I want you to invite God to be God in that situation. This isn't you exercising more authority or having more knowledge, this is you trusting your heavenly father who already knows what you need. He already knows. So father, we trust you 
with these things that cause us anxiety. We know you're generous. We know you're faithful. We know you are kind. We know you are with us. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.